But if you have uh, just come from dinner and did this before you came here, right? If you look in the refrigerator at the end of the day and say, what looks good, you're dead. Because, and we're going to explain why you're dead. That's the killer. So my objective tonight, say, what are Susan Pierce Thompson's bright lines? And going to go a little bit of her background, and then just, it's the psychology. I need, I have a deep understanding to, to, I just need to understand this stuff. It's just interesting to me. And then if we can give you some, enough of the method for you to feel effective at doing it for yourself. So, what are her bright lines? A bright line is something absolutely crystal clear, no, no ambiguity about it. And then encase them into nice rigid habits, and she's got four lines. No sugar, no flour, no snacks, otherwise known as three meals, and everything gets weighed. The everything gets weighed is the real killer, because boy, do I'm going to tell you my, about my little problems. I've got a little lying lizard brain that's just the nastiest thing. So Susan Pierce Thompson's story is kind of interesting. She was so smart, she got into University of California, Berkeley as a high school kid. And like by age 16, so she was, you know, accelerated little one of those little smarty pants who could, you know, solve every problem and score well on every test without her parents cheating for her. Um, <laughs> But she was having issues with weight and eating disorders, and she felt so stressed about it that she decided to take a little detour through methamphetamine and cocaine. And she spent five years that she doesn't completely remember and discovered a whole lot of 12-step programs that were partially helpful and partially out of, whether it was character or good luck or serendipity or love and attention from friends and support, she escaped those drugs. God bless her. But she continued to cycle in and out of weight gain, weight loss, weight gain, weight loss. And so she got interested as she went through university, PhD, full professorship. She was interested in weight loss because she says that's the crisis, that's the epidemic in our society. What's going on in our society that's making everybody struggle with this? And that was her interest. So she... Uh, got her PhD and then worked on a postdoc and she used various drugs all that time and basically said, I'm going to start a program and she, her, her code name or her label or her brand is Brightline Eating. So I'm really just reviewing, I'm basically one big advertisement for Susan Thompson tonight because I think she's a unique American genius to figure this stuff out. So what I'd like to go, just a little bit, I'm going to go a little epidemiology. What percent of people successfully lose weight of BMI from 30 to 25 and keep it there? Do you know? Percent. Do you know what the percent is? 1%. That's correct. Oh. Who read the book? I just did the 14 day. Right. Good work. Oh. One tenth of 1%. Oh, that's horrible. Takes weight off from BMI of 30. So do you know how to calculate your BMI if you want to ever do it? You take your weight in pounds divided by your height in inches twice. So I'm 210, I'm 77 inches, so divided by 77, divided by 77, and that's the metric conversion number because it's defined as centimeters divided by kilos, so it was a metric formula in the beginning. So 703 is what converts it back into the normal formula. And so we want you to be at 25, supposedly, but if you look at folks who have a BMI of 22 and folks who have a BMI of 25, Folks who have a BMI of 25 still have five to six times the risk of getting diabetes compared to folks at 22. So 22 is, uh, you might argue, that's really what most people should think about. Maybe that's what we should be. Okay. And this is what's going on in America. We've got the relative amount of overweight has stayed the same, but what's filling in is everybody's moving up a notch. So the extremely overweight is extremely obese are getting higher and higher and higher. And that's been going on for the last 50 years. Uh, what happens when that happens? We become diabetic. So the link between getting overweight and becoming <coughs> ill in one fashion or another is pretty solid. It's pretty, pretty sure. About a certain percentage of people who are overweight seem to be able to pull it off and not get metabolically challenged. 
but the majority of people who are overweight get in trouble. And so here's a model that I want you to, if you can understand these, this slide, I've already succeeded. This is what you look like. This is the size of your fat cell when you're a skinny teenager and all elbows and knees. And you can eat anything you want. You don't seem to gain weight. And your insulin receptors are close to each other. And your fat globule is pretty small. As you put on weight, you don't grow more fat cells. They just get bigger. They just get bigger. And as they get bigger, the fat globule gets bigger. But as the fat globule gets bigger, you still have roughly the same amount of cellular water, which is what determines how many receptors you have on your surface. So how close are the receptors here compared to here compared to here? And if I told you you have to have two insulin receptors next to each other for a fat cell to be responsive, you would say, uh-oh, so what's going to happen is here my blood sugar is 80 and my insulin level is 5. Here my, and inside the cell, my sugar is, my glucose is 80. But here, my blood sugar is 95 and we say that's still normal because the receptors are further apart. And now my insulin level is 15, but the problem is it's taking 15 and I'm working a little harder my sugar is no longer 80 inside the cell, it's now 70. Are you getting the trend here? What happens here? My blood sugar is now 110. My insulin level is 25. And inside the cell, I'm 55. So my cells are starving to death inside. We think that's the model that's going on with Alzheimer's that our brain cells get insulin resistant and eventually they can't take up glucose and they actually starve to death and die. And what, what's very interesting to me is Alzheimer's patients who are going through sundowning look just like a hypoglycemic patient. And having had a mother just die of Alzheimer's and having seen her sundown a hundred times, I've, and I've been an emergency doctor for half my career, uh, I can tell you what that looks like. If you understand this sequence, then then this is a, you've got a huge understanding of diabetes. So as you lose weight, your insulin level drops, your blood sugar drops, but your, more importantly, your insulin resistance goes away, and inside your cell, you're getting nutrition. All right. The problem is that Susan Thompson talks about, there's three processes that go awry that we want to talk about. And they're kind of interesting once you understand these. So I'm going to talk about broken brain one, two, and three. And oops, uh, well, it's willpower, and you're going to have to guess what number two. <laughs> Irresistible cravings and uh, insatiable appetite. And I'm not sure if I got them in the right order. But these three processes all work to integrate your brain's response to food. And in the modern era, those three psychological processes but our brain processes are what's broken. So let's, that's what I want to do a deep dive into. So let's talk about that. Oh, we're going to go over them in depth. I promise you, each one gets about 10 slides. Number one, willpower. How many of you have a lot of willpower? That's the question you get asked, right? As though it was a personality trait. We often think of willpower as an aspect of our moral character or a tool that gets more effective with commitment. How do we use it? We marshal it. That's what you think. So on January 1st, I'm going to lose weight. Mm. Right? Turns out that's not true. Willpower isn't a personality trait. It's a resource that you have a certain amount of. Willpower is a brain function and a resource. And you've got 15 minutes of it each day. Each day you get a new deck of cards, 15 minutes. What does that mean? I just used a half a second. <laughs> I used another half a second. When we look at our cell phone 800 times a day, what are we doing to our willpower? When you 
Look at food 180 times a day. What are you doing to your willpower? You have to make a decision again and again and again. Well, where did this come from? Where so willpower governs your ability to focus. It's your ability to look sharply into something and see it and focus and remember on it and bond with it, okay? So it kind of monitors how well are you doing work? How well are you accomplishing what you need to be doing? Your ability to focus, get what's done, needs to be done, okay? So it regulates a kind of regulator of emotions and more importantly, it helps us make choices. Willpower is what gives us the will, the, the, the determination to say, yep, I want that, don't want that. that. You've seen yourself doing that, and there's time you have will, willpower, and your husband or wife says something to you and say, oh, honey, you just decide. I just don't have the emotional energy to decide that. You felt that, because that's in, that's in all of us. Well, th this is what I think is fun. Let's look at the radish experiment to understand willpower. I'm going to bring each of you into the room next door here, and I'm going to put you sitting at a table telling you that I've got an experiment to you. Would, you, would you fill out these forms first before we do the experiment? And actually, the experiment is that there's a plate of warm chocolate chip cookies sitting there. Please don't touch those. Those are for the people in the next experiment. You can't have those. You, you can't have those. Please, that for the next experiment. Some other people get a bowl of radishes. Please don't touch those, you can't have those. And other people, you can have them, they're yours. Come in hungry after an overnight fast, to be eaten or not. In the next room, they have a quiz they have to do that's impossible. It's this incredibly difficult geometry question that may not even have a solution. How long are you going to be able to stick with it? What's happened to the groups of people? If you had a chocolate chip cookie and there's no witnesses, <laughs> I used to work in the ER. Every night I worked a night shift, I would take a tray of brownies in. Holly always cooked a tray of brownies taken to the ER when I worked the night shift. And I've witnessed a hundred times, it's 3.30 in the morning, you're kind of tired, you're back taking a break watching CNN news mindlessly, and you're having a cup of coffee, and you're eating a brownie, and there's a nurse, and you're talking about your kids in school, and then the pager rings. And you step out of the room, and you answer the call, and you step back in again, and it's only been 12 seconds, and a row of brownies is missing. And all you see is one little crumb on the, <laughs> watching TV, nothing happened. <laughs> Six brownies, where'd they go? And I've seen that happen a hundred times, and I've done it 200. <laughs> so I know what happens. Okay? So guess what happens? Those who've been resisting the chocolate chip cookies give up on the geometry quiz in eight minutes. Those who didn't have to think about it went 19 minutes. Radishes? Oh, I can go 19 minutes, no problem. <laughs> Isn't that hilarious? I think it's a hilarious experiment. It's the famous radish experiment. But what that came, what that brought to light, this was the first experiment that brought to light that willpower is not moral function. It's a resource that gets used up. And you use it up at your peril. And there's, and so we've actually got about 15 minutes each day, every email, every errand, every decision making. If those of you have teenagers in the house, <laughs> your willpower is used up pretty quickly because they push, 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 push. Judges who are putting prisoners up for parole, if you have a judge who hasn't had a break, you have a 15% ads of getting parole, 65% after the break, 65%. You know, judges, impartial judges. No, I'm too tired. I can't make a decision go back to jail. What we now know it's when you're tired, your blood sugar's lower, and this part of your brain, your anterior cingulate nucleus, is where you affect willpower. That's where willpower comes from. And it's particularly susceptible to low blood sugar. And at the end of the day, you've got low blood sugar. Uh-oh, I was playing too much. So here's where you do your rational decision making in the front part of your brain, but here in your anterior cingulate nucleus is where willpower comes from and late in the day, and you're tired, 
and you've already made your 210 decisions about food and your 47 decisions about no to your teenagers and your cell phone has gone off 7,000 times and you just got home from work and you haven't, don't have a clue what you're going to eat, you have no willpower. It's gone. And you've all found times where at 8 o'clock in the evening you've found yourself eating food that you never would have eaten before because you have no willpower then. So you just fell into what Susan Thompson calls the willpower gap. And we've all experienced it and it starts, once you put the language around it and articulate it, it rings true. Okay, so resisting temptation uses up willpower and you've only got those 15 minutes. So if we do an experiment and we give folks a beeper and we page them randomly all day long to inquire what they're resisting, just page them at random intervals. What are you thinking about right now? Is there something you'd like to be doing that you aren't, that you'd want to be doing? Turns out, over 7,000 data points, four hours a day resisting something. Food, sex, checkbook, fa you know, checking, Facebook, napping, TV. All day long. And food is number one. That's our number one item. Okay? 211 food choices a day, every day of the world. So, how do you replenish willpower? Got any ideas? You know how to replenish willpower? Actually, when you hear the list, you'll say, oh, that makes sense. Brownies. That helps. Yeah. So you feel better. You get some willpower back. <clears throat> but how about calming yourself down? How about meditating? How about having friends that you can just laugh with? A game of cribbage? How about a nap? Or just eight hours of sleep? and you restore willpower. Attitude of gratitude. If I can do a small ad here, my wife has just written a book called The Practice of Finding, How Gratitude Leads to Enough. I've been selling it in my office and everybody who's bought it. <coughs> a wonderful book, okay, on Amazon.com. <laughs> Last name Whitcomb. So. But the willpower gap conclusion at any given minute, you may have no willpower capacity. And if you're trying to lose, if you're trying to say, I'm going to lose weight on January 1st, about 4 o'clock January 2nd, you're done. Right? Because you just got tired. You went back to work, and your cell phone was buzzing all day long, and blah, blah, blah. So you've got to plan for it. You're not weak-willed. It's just you've had 15 minutes, and life happens. So we're going to have to find some method, and this bright line method says that's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to show you how to avoid the willpower gap. And at any given moment, you know, we'll show you how to fix it. Number two, insatiable hunger. Insatiable hunger. Through most of human history, we had to eat as much as we could whenever we came upon it. As a hunter-gatherer, you come across a patch of pumpkins in September, and what are you going to do? You're going to eat every pumpkin you can possibly eat because in October you're going to have a freeze and they'll all be dead and gone and you have to make it through winter, so you better put on weight quickly in September. We don't have winter anymore. And we have pick and save that has pumpkin anytime you want it. Okay? So it was raw and unprocessed, so it had a lot of fiber in it. And gorillas chew seven hours a day. You know how much time we spend a day chewing? little under seven minutes. So because raw vegetable food takes a lot of thinking about and chewing, we don't have to spend seven hours a day chewing. We can just open up a can and have some cream cheese. Away it goes. So we learn, then we learn to cook. And cooking, by heating up cook raw food, makes calories much more accessible. And then we learned how to grow grains and store them 5,000 years ago. This was probably three, four million years ago. But we learned how to grow grains and store them. And that was about 5,000 years ago. And once we got grains and started making grains, we could have calories all year round. So we didn't have to worry about having seasonal calories. And then we learned how to grind up grains here in Wisconsin. Pillsbury bought the patent from the guy who invented it, who's in Nina, the guy who invented it, and Pillsbury invented it, and Minneapolis begins making white flour, and we can now get unbelievably calorie-dense products, and all of us in this room have grown up in the world of fine white flour, 
thank you, Jesus. You know, because give me, give me sugar and flour, and I can do I can do wicked things. So one of my examples of lack of willpower is one night when I was working in the ER at St. Luke's, was when Krispy Kremes came to town. You know, down there on Highway 100 in Oklahoma. Well, I used to work at St. Luke's. So it's now 11.30 at night, and I stop at Krispy Kreme's, and there's a line of people. There's like four people ahead of me. I'm a little nervous. I've got to get to work on time. So I buy a dozen. I didn't have, I didn't have a, you know, brownies, so I buy a dozen donuts. How many people here can drive a minivan with one hand? <laughs> right? Warm Krispy Kreme's, one hand. I'm at Highway 100, 92nd Street. I've already had two. By 76th Street, I've had four. By 35th Street, I've had eight. By the time I get to the parking garage, I've had nine. Can you imagine how stupid it is to bring in three donuts into the ER? So I just sat in the garage and finished them off. Talk about buzzed. But, you know, we've all done that. Well, maybe some of you haven't, but I certainly have. Insatiable hunger. The problem is we have changed our brain because we've made so many artificial flavors that make food so irresistibly delicious, and we have such calorie-dense food that we've actually altered our brain and we've damaged our brain. And this is how we've broken it. We've broken it because we've gotten, a f we've gotten food where we keep on piling on more food. So you finish dinner, oh, but there's a buffet bar for dessert. Let's just start all over again. New flavors. Every time you start with a new flavor, you reset your hunger appetite. And sugar. Because, so on the way home, you stop at Cops and have some ice cream. N none of you have ever done that. I have done that. Okay. But insatiable hunger has two interesting attributes. One is you want to lay, sit down and just be lazy. And the other is you aren't, you aren't satisfied. What's wrong with that? You mean you ate and ate and ate? You ate like that and you're still hungry? Well, guess what happens if I look at your F functional MRI scan? I can show that the normal compensation of feeling full doesn't work. The parts of your brain have reduced impact after eating a meal. You aren't getting an impact on your brain. And so what's going on with all that? Well, the problem is we've doubled our calories that we can consume, and they have no volume, and you get a rapid rise in sugar and a huge spike in insulin. And guess what insulin does? Insulin, as you become insulin resistant, you're now getting into trouble with a huge spike of insulin. And insulin, well, here's just some examples. Folks, who, as you get overweight, as you start putting on weight, look what's happening to your blood sugar when you have a high-carb meal versus a low-carb meal. Okay. Here's raw broccoli, raw fruit, and salad. Here's hamburger fries and a milkshake. And as we put on more weight, we become more diabetes prone. So our blood sugar level for diabetics does that after a meal. A pre-diabetic does that. A, a slender person does that. And when you do that with blood sugar, your insulin level's right behind. And that insulin, oh, even artificial sweeteners. So what do you think, what effect do you think artificial sweeteners would have on you? Yeah. That's actually, I'm, I'm not answering, but oh. back to the reduced neural response. Oh, I'm getting to this. Okay. I'll, I'm, I've got a slide coming. Turns out artificial sweeteners tell your body, sugar's coming, and then no sugar shows up. But when your body thinks sugar's coming, what hormone do you put out? Insulin. insulin. What does insulin do to your blood sugar? drives it down, but there was no sugar to drive down, so what happens to your blood sugar? It gets a little lower. So what happens four hours later? You eat more. The problem was, is when you have sweetener, you eat more. There's abundant evidence in animal models, in human models. You take a hundred women and give them a, di a, sh a diet soda a day for free, they will guaranteed gain weight. If you take rats, and give them yogurt with artificial sweeteners, they gain more weight than if you gave them yogurt with sugar. Artificial sweeteners are deadly because they confuse your brain with a, while you still get the same endocrine effect, which is nuts. 
and it's that catch-up effect that four hours later, insulin sends off a little, sugar sends off enough of a catch-up effect, but artificial sweeteners are equally wicked. So for those of you who think you're saying, I'm not getting any calories, I mean, you know, I'm drinking a diet soda, there's no calories in it, but you're setting off the same cascade that you set off by, set, by eating sugared food, and it's even a bigger cascade because the compensation rebound is even higher. And meals have changed through most, you know, through most of human history. We had to work to find food, and then we had to collect it, and it was pretty raw and rough, and then to put it together so you could bring it down to dinner, so we had meal times. We don't have meal times anymore. We have a microwave. When you get hungry, you go to the refrigerator, take something out, put it, heat it up, and feed it up. And then you get some nuts because we have some nuts, and you have a you have a pantry full of snack food, and you don't, you know, your your spouse is working at alternative times, so you're not home at the same time together. So in this 24-hour uh, world where we work in with people working all sorts of hours, so we don't have meal times. So we don't sit down at the beginning and the end of the meal every day. And if you look at our human behavior, we just don't do that. And at work, you don't sit down for half an hour with friends and eat and talk and laugh. You sit at your desk or you, you, know, you have a sandwich because you know, you're trying to catch up and ca keep up with all the work that's to be done. We, didn't, you know, we only invented the refrigerator 80 years ago. In fact, I grew, I grew up in India without a refrigerator. We had a pinjura, which was basically a little box with, with a, a, a screen on the side so the flies couldn't get in. And that's where we put our leftovers. But we had to eat leftovers within four hours, it would go bad. So all we had was something to keep the flies off. So you could put a cake in there so you know, flies wouldn't sit on the cake. But we didn't have refrigerator until I was eight. I remember getting our first, we got a refrigerator, a kerosene refrigerator. You know, so in our lifetime, your parents grew up without refrigerators too. You know, so it's now we're beginning to, now we all, my kids look at me and say, oh, you're such an old fuddy-duddy, you know. But a microwave, I remember when the microwaves came out, remember how exciting they were when they first came out? They were like $500. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> and it was such a cool thing to have a house with a microwave in it. Oh, well, okay. In the meantime, where are you damaging things? It turns out the <laughs> Your internal command center for temperature and thirst and sex drive and fatigue and sleep and circadian rhythm are in your hypothalamus, and that's what puts out leptin. And what does leptin do? Does anybody know what leptin does? Leptin is put out by fat cells, and it says, I've had enough to eat. I've had enough to eat. Stop eating. Okay? That works. It's your appetite suppressing hormone. Without it, you don't know when to stop. With it, you get feedback. If you cut out the leptin gene, look what happens to rats that don't have the leptin gene. Isn't that interesting? If you give that rat leptin, they'll get skinny again. Isn't that interesting? So what causes broken brain number two, insatiable appetite, is leptin resistance. And it's set off, we lose that feedback loop, and it's set off because of insulin. So you eat high sugar food, you start putting on weight, and you get into this vicious cycle of climbing and climbing and climbing and getting more and more leptin resistant. Now what Susan Thompson doesn't talk about is folks who then, uh, the 25% of the population that is mold sensitive and has chronic fatigue syndrome and fibromyalgia they become triply leptin resistant. So if you're mold sensitive and live in a moldy home and ha have mold, 75% of people aren't. But those folks, I've been measuring leptins for a couple of years now, and I've been stunned by everybody with chronic, with mold, with SIRS, chronic inflammatory response syndrome, will have leptins in the 70s and 80s, and they can't lose weight. They, say, I put, I get, they come to see me because they said, I've gained 50 pounds in the last year, and I have no idea where it came from. You go, oh, you, you begin to understand it. But lep insulin blocks leptin down here in your brainstem, in your lizard brain. And what's your lizard brain responsible for? This is part of your brain that does things by things like breathing, swallowing, blood pressure, wakefulness, things you can't really control. 
These are functions you can't really control. How hungry you feel isn't something you can easily control. So what's happened to insulin levels in Wisconsin in the last 50 years, or in the last 30 years? I find this really interesting. 1990, the normal range of Aurora Healthcare was 1.9 to 18. Okay? Now the normal, then in 2000, it was 2.1 to 24. Then in 2010, it was 2.4 to 29. In Fond du Lac, it goes up to 64. What's happening here? The average Wisconsin person is getting bigger. So the whole state, we're all getting bigger. So our average insulin level is rising. So what they call the normal range is rising. The healthy range is really below 3.5. A healthy insulin is below 3.5. Oh. Because if you have an insulin level of 24, you're going to be leptin resistant like crazy, and now you're cut in a, t a bear trap you can't get out of. You just can't get out of it. Broken brain number three, overpowering cravings. There's some food you just have to have. You have periods of time when you are just so hungry you can't stand it. And you have this overwhelming urge to fix a craving, and you get out of your car, you get out of your apartment and drive to cops with your bathrobe on, to get four scoops of chocolate ice cream with double ice cream. Oh, if you meet me there, you know, pre pretend not to know me, okay? <laughs> We've all done silly behaviors like that to some degree. The you know, it's like, I, I'm, 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 me and cops are tight, real tight. Again, there's a different part of your brain that gets in trouble here. And this is where Susan Thompson's done some of her own unique research that she brings to bear. And then we're, we're going to go through that. It's called the nucleus accumbens. Anybody ever heard of the nucleus accumbens? Anybody here ever heard of dopamine? That's where dopamine comes from. This part of your brain is right here in the fr front here, is your nucleus accumbens. And it's in charge of ambition and motivation, which is adaptive behavior and goals and all that. But the bad side is, uncontrollable cravings with destructive behavior, and they're sort of two sides of the same sword. <coughs> well, guess what sets off? It's a, so it's the seat of motivation and pleasure and reward. So what motivates you? What gives you great pleasure? There's lots of things that give you pleasure. Eating good food works. Great sex helps. <laughs> Friendship is good. Play is fun. Exercise feels great. Those are all good rewards. Those are wonderful things. You put out a little bit of dopamine. You know, those are good songs, soap and dope. But <laughs> when I was a kid, I remember finding my first Playboy. <laughs> oh my God, I'd never seen anything like that. Now I can't get away from Playboy. Oh my, the internet is just so filled with trash. There's eternally stimulation. We're all being overstimulated by food, by sex, by anything that gets your attention. Because TV and media are trying to drive to get your attention. And so now we used to see one vague sexy scene once in a lifetime when we were walking through the woods as hunter-gatherers and you chance upon some young thing in the water somewhere. <laughs> but now we're just overwhelmed with overwhelming, horrible, and so we've become inured to it. What's happened? We have, our nucleus accumbens has had its dopamine so overstimulated that we are now dopamine deficient. Guess what else does that? What else redu reduces the dopamine in your brain? Cocaine. More heroin. Those are wicked drugs. But when you overstimulate something, the reason that cocaine works and is such a powerful stimulant is that very first burst of cocaine gives you this flood of dopamine. You'll never get a second rush like the first one. You're all, many addicts will tell you they're always chasing their first rush. But after a while, their dopamine's so depleted, they're actually just trying to get back to normal. Because they're so depleted, when they aren't using it, they feel horrible. Okay. So to protect our receptors, we reset our reward cells to lower centers. 
So then we're just trying to get just back to normal. We're trying to just get back to normal. So through most of human history, how much sugar did we have? Honey. And the price of honey was you had to go raid the hive. Where did honey, do you know where sugar came from? Do you know what the story of sugar is? Sugar cane was found in New Guinea by the Chinese around 1300. They brought it to India around the 1400. The Mughal Empire was making sugar and the first caravans of Arabs coming across the Middle East were bringing sugar to the Venetians. And Columbus, he wants to grow sugar, but heck, he can't grow any in Italy, so let's go find a place we can grow it. And that was the beginning. And was, so we were getting about five pounds a year in the year 1500, and we were willing to pay a fortune for it. Each of us is now currently eating 10% of our calories is sugar. And 80% of American foods have sugar added to it. Just tell me what you do when you eat one tablespoon of peanut butter. Right? When you eat one big tablespoon of peanut butter, can anybody here stop after one tablespoon? Because no. <laughs> a third of the calories in sugar um, in peanut butter are actually sugar. And it's, that's almost subliminal. You don't really think about it until you eat plain peanut butter. And you guys, oh, that's plain peanut butter. Yuck, that doesn't taste good. <clears throat> what you're doing is setting off these sugar receptors. You know, maybe ripe blackberries in season. Now it's 10% of our calories. So what happens if we're exposed to sugar to our nucleus accumbens? We downregulate. Our nucleus accumbens gets downregulated because we're doing the same thing with sugar that we do with cocaine and methamphetamine. Okay, this is my pop quiz. What's this product? Who can identify that for me? It's cocaine. Okay, you can't tell. They all look the same. Yeah. They all look the same. That's people make jokes about it. Coke addicts say, "Well, you know, they talk about the you know, little line of sugar." Okay. <laughs> the poppy, the pleasant little flower, extract the sap and heat it up and get the extract from the poppy. The coca leaf. Anybody here been to Peru? Everybody in the highlands of Peru is chewing coca leaves all the time. It's like sipping a cup of coffee. They don't get high from it. They have a mild stimulant effect. But if we take it and extract the alkaloid out of it, we can concentrate it and make it into cocaine. Sugar, if you have delicious beets or apples, tastes great. But what happens if you purify it and turn it into crystalline form? Are you getting the analogy? The crystalline form, flour, same thing. So if I take your brain and I put you in a functional MRI scan and I give you amphetamine, I can see your nucleus accumbens go kapow. Here's a normal brain, but here's an overweight person. Here's an alcoholic. Here's a cocaine user. What do you see? <coughs> Depleted nucleus accumbens. Depleted nucleus accumbens. Here's somebody who has normal dopamine. This is a sugar, a, sh a person who's gotten down-regulated by sugar. They've gotten addicted to sugar. Okay. So here's some example research. If you take three groups of healthy rats with healthy brains, and one group is fed, fed standard pellets, another group is given a buffet of super delicious food, but only for an hour a day. You know, whatever rats love. And the third group is given the super buffet for 23 hours a day. Guess who gets overweight? The last group. This group doesn't get overweight because they only have it for an hour. But if you have it all day long, and you have snacks all over the place, that's one kind of research. And they have, if you then, t you're allowed to sample rats of mucus accumbens. We humans take exception to it. You can show that they've got marked down regulation in their accumbens. They had gotten addicted. Another example, <coughs> take healthy rats and inject them cocaine till they're cocaine addicted. You now have cocaine addicted rats, all right? Then offer them cocaine water or, sweet wa or sugar water. Guess which they take? The sugar water. They find the sugar water better than co sat for satisfying what they want. So they'll choose sugar. They get just as big a high from sugar as they do from cocaine. And it's not the fat, it's the sugar. You can do research in adults. If you take adult humans and put them in a functional MRI scan and give them milkshakes with variable amounts of fat in it versus variable amounts of sugar in it, you can see how much they drink, not by the fat, but by the sugar. It's the sugar that drives how much they consume. 
And the food industry in America knows that. I can sell you more milkshakes if I can put more sugar and sneak it into your food so you don't know it. So you think you're buying nice soup mix and you're getting Progresso soup and you look on ingredient number seven and it says dehydrated cane juice. And you're stupid enough not to know that that's sugar. One of the 55 names of sugar that they don't want to put in there without hoping you won't understand it. And most of us are. We don't pay attention because we don't spend time looking because the print's so little. And son of a gun, there it is, snuck into it. And I'm such a sugar addict, I'm happy to get it because I'm, that way I can pretend I didn't know. Okay? <laughs> so we're leading a down-regulated life. You only have to be on sugar for three weeks and your brain is down-regulated. Three weeks and your brain is down-regulated. So you're now feeling depressed between meals, your ability to taste is diminished, your anticipation of food is great, but your satisfaction is horrible. So let's look at Susan Thompson. Let's just do a little break here. Answer some of these questions. My ability to control how much I eat never changes. I stopped eating when I was full. I was practically non-existent. Once I started eating, I felt powerless to stop. Where are you on this layer? After eating a moderate amount of food, I nearly always feel satisfied. I practically never felt satisfied. Where are you? Two, three, four, five? My cravings for a specific food are infrequent and quite mild if I had them at all. Where are you on this list? Do you have cravings or were frequent all the time, powerful, drove me to go to great lengths to get them? The amount of time and energy consumed in my thoughts of food, my weight and what I, had, I hadn't eaten was small. I don't think about it that much was overwhelming, I think about it almost all the time. Okay? In terms of binges, consuming huge amounts of food while feeling out of control and powerless, I may have overeaten occasionally, but I never binge. I experience frequent, severe binges. Where are you on that list? You can take this test on Susan Thompson's website, and she'll walk you through it, and then she gives you your score back. And here's your score. Actually, there's like six more questions. I just didn't want to do all the slides. And it turns out that about a third of us are quite susceptible. We're eight, nines, and tens. A third of us are seven, six, fives, and fours. And a third of us are... I'm an eight. I thought, oh, boy, that sure explains a lot. <laughs> I still remember those 12 donuts. And I'm still thinking about those 12 donuts. So I'm particularly susceptible to it. And I found myself doing it. Okay. Uh, I'm not going to go through that. But we also get turned on by different signs and symbols. And we have so many symbols in our society that drive what we go to. But the conclusion our physiology is our whole life has become a series of cues and signs to eat, reinforced by our broken brains, and brought about by a new environment of unbelievably delicious, flavorful foods that are available 24-7 in every venue we go to. So all day long we're caught in this trap and you think it's because you didn't have willpower. And I would contend you're in a perfect mouse trap. You can't get out of it. So we have to be smart. This isn't the end of the world. We got to figure it out. But before we figure it out we got to understand one more little wicked devil. Your saboteur. Did you read about the saboteur yet? How many people have read about the saboteur? Oh, good. Okay, one or two of you. All right, here's the saboteur. This is a huge advance in brain science. I think this is hilarious. Think of your brain. Neuroscientists no longer think of your brain as, you think of your brain as being you. You know, this is me. I'm John. Actually, my brain represents a committee. I've got about five or six parts of my brain back there that have a voice. And when they come up to the surface, it's all John but they're actually competing with each other. There's different parts of your brain that compete for different points of attention, and you interpret them. <coughs> How do you find those different parts? Well, let me give you an example. You know, each of them functions at various different parts of the... Let me find an example. I want everybody here to take a real deep breath. <sighs> now hold your breath, and I'm going to keep you out for two minutes. We're not going to go two minutes, but, but you're beginning to feel a little short of breath right now. You're beginning to think this guy's a little nuts. 
in about one minute, if we actually went a whole minute, you'd say, this guy is totally crazy. And at about one minute and 10 seconds, you'd take a deep breath and say, I want to live. Because I feel like I'm going to die. What, what took over? Your brainstem. Your brainstem is in charge of keeping you alive. Your automatic brainstem said, this guy is crazy. We're not going to listen to everything. I don't care what his willpower thing says. That's just baloney. We're not shell divers and there aren't pearls here, so we don't have to worry about it. Breathe or die. Those are different parts of your brain speaking to you. And that's one way of examining it, but you can find it in other ways. And this is how what first started the whole journey. Back in the 1960s, there were, back before we had modern epilepsy drugs, there were some people who had such horrible epilepsy, they couldn't control them, and they tried an experiment. They tried cutting their brain in half, right through the corpus callosum. They only did it to a small number of people before they realized it had devastating consequences. But it did stop the seizures, so at least it stopped the seizures, so it had some effect. But it turns out your left brain is a logical part of your brain, the right brain is, co is, logic is creative and da da da, but your right hand is really controlled by left sided, left hand is controlled by right sided, vision crosses over. Hmm, so what happens? What happens if we cut it apart and we, well, let me get to what the experiment was. Oh no, let me get back to this experiment. I'm sorry. What happens if we cut, we do the experiment where we cut it apart and we show you a picture of a chicken and a snowplow and a chicken's foot and a sponge and we tell you to match them. But you, one is on one side of your brain, one's on the other's field of vision. And you're meant to pick up the chicken and the chicken foot. When you do experiments like that, but they're on opposite sides, you find out that the people who've had the surgery don't do that at all. They just pick up random pieces and you say, why'd you do that? Oh, because the, the sponge goes with chickens and that's how we clean them off. They found that people completely confabulated and just made up excuses that had no connection to reality whatsoever. The left side of your brain has a part in it that's basically your left hemisphere organizer. And it sort of lies for you. It says, okay, she's doing this behavior, so we're just going to make it up and tell them that's what you should be doing. That's your saboteur. Your left hemispheric organizer is your saboteur. And you may be getting all sorts of motivations going on that may be blocked and all sorts of messages getting on. And your dopamine receptor says, just go ahead and eat, you know, because I'm starving hungry, because I'm just absolutely famished, because I'm so addicted to sugar, I need you to have some more. And we simply say in our own voice, our left hemisphere interpreter says, okay, you've had a tough day, haven't you? You deserve it. It was really hard at work. They just gave you such a hard time. You poor baby. So your left hemisphere interpreter, and so what do you say? I don't eat a thing, I blow up like a balloon. <laughs> no, 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 you've been eating like a little horse. <laughs> but I just had such a hard day, I, didn't eat, I deserve a little snack. Or, there aren't that many calories in nuts. Or, it's the flavor of the day, I'll just have well, two scoops. Right? So I'm at my brother's house this weekend. I'm on good behavior. I've just finished his PowerPoint. It's my brother's 60th birthday. And my sister-in-law brings out a seven-layer chocolate cheesecake from, I don't know, one of these food places that makes seven layers of sugar. <laughs> and I said, I'll just take a quarter piece. Just give me a thin sliver. And I said that to my sister-in-law. But my niece picks up a big giant piece and brings it over and puts it in front of me. And, mm, can I have the cream? You know, I'm at my brother's house. I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. I'll just eat the whole thing. <laughs> it was probably a 2,000 calorie <laughs> slice of cake. Oh, God, was it good. Did I feel full at the end? No. I felt sleepy. I could hardly move. You know, that just huge calorie count. Ah! But that's just my saboteur talking to me and making it up for me. Instead of me having the willpower saying, no, I'm just, I don't do sugar. I'm not doing that. 
So how do we design a system? You now know how your brain gets broken. You know how ridiculously vulnerable you are. But it's not really your fault. It's the environment we're in that creates it, that makes it almost like a rat trap. You're caught in a rat trap. So we got to be smarter than the rat trap. And that's what Susan has been. And she's figured out bright line reading. So we're going to design the system for you. Here's the structure. We're going to go through it. Four simple rules. No sugar, no flour, no snacks, and weigh your food. It's that simple. Now there's some nuance to it, and that's what the devil's in the details. Because I think there should be five, and five is plan your meals for tomorrow the night before. Sit down every day with a journal and write down what you're going to eat. And today into my office walked a woman who used to weigh 290, and this morning she weighed 250, and she was triumphant. And I was asking, okay, what are you doing? And she says, you know, I started just, every day I just pack my lunch and breakfast the night before. And if I do that, when I get to work, I don't have to make any decisions. I said, why didn't you write the book? <laughs> I said, my gosh, you come up with bright line eating on your own. And she says, it works for me. I finally found something that works. And I hadn't talked to her about Brighton. I haven't seen her for a year. She had done this all on her own. She was just trying and trying and trying and finding the different things that worked. So I think number five should be sit down the night before and write down what you're going to do. Otherwise, yeah. <laughs> right? Anybody ever done that? Oh, yeah. The whole bag? The whole bag? Oh, good. You're one of my friends. Yeah. <laughs> right. We've all done that. Because once you start on sugar, especially 8 o'clock at night when you're watching a pretty good crime show, mm -hmm. whew, off you go. I've got a question. What about the person who eats potato chips? Oh, just as bad. It's the sugar. Yeah. Well, it's, a, it's a glucose. It's, it's, it's glucose. I just love salt. I don't right. Yeah. It's oh, the carbs. Okay. Or popcorn. Yeah. You can get popcorn hooked or you can get... <laughs> Your little saboteur is very crafty, <laughs> and, and, and your voice, a little voice will come out from your left hemisphere saying, you've had such a tough day. <laughs> you really deserve this. <laughs> and, and if you can have a sense of humor about how ridiculously vulnerable we are, you can forgive yourself. You know, yeah. So what's your left hemisphere's motivation for doing it? What's your motivation for doing it? Uh, your left hemisphere's motivation is in those few seconds each day when you actually have a little bit of sanity about what your health risks are from being overweight and how you want to look and how you want to have control of your life and for those few seconds when you've got a, a sane approach to it. Because you may otherwise, otherwise you fall into the trap of chasing what you feel, what feels right. What, what do you mean? I'm not sure. I'm sure. It's yeah. What's the motivation for it to make excuses? Here. I'm not quite sure I understand. I'm, I'm being okay, stupid. The excuse works. about you've had a tough day. What good does that do your brain to give you that excuse? I'm not sure that you can think of it in practical terms. You're addicted. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's not practical. It's not, pra it's not logical. Okay. The problem is, is there's another field of science that Susan goes into. I'll, I'll just do the segue right here. And that is we thought for a long time that we knew our own inner voice, that you intrinsically knew yourself. And it turns out there's now pretty good research, and it's pretty elegant, that shows we judge ourselves the way we judge others. Ch talk is cheap. Let me see what you do. And the problem is, is when our saboteur then lies for us, we judge ourselves because we see ourselves becoming vulnerable and finishing off the whole bag of chocolate chips. And nobody, there's been no witnesses. We're the only witness, but we judge ourselves mercilessly. And our own judgment is the worst of all, because we're merciless with ourselves because we've watched our behavior. And so that's, that's damaging to yourself. You just don't feel good about yourself. I have no control. I can't do that. You know, blah, 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 all that. So bright line, no sugar. Susan says it's not extreme. 70,000 people use losing a leg every year to diabetes is extreme. That's what's happening in diabetes right now. The end stage, my father died of diabetes and I saw him progress through the whole final stages of terrifying, horrible complications. That's, that's extreme. 
Well, that's half the other half, that's the half of motivates me. The other half motivates me is my mother died of Alzheimer's. So I'm not sure which of those two I want. Uh, but we're all basically addicted. Sugar is just a dangerous drug. There's no such thing as everything in moderation. Sugar is a dangerous drug. And we're getting 10% of our calories from it. 10% of our calories. Yes? So where do things that aren't considered artificial, like stevia, monk fruit, erythritol, where do those fit in? They don't fit in. How your body reacts. It's they, te they teach you to put out insulin. Get used to other flavors. And Susan T Thompson's argument is, and this is what I'm trying to put together is two weeks for myself, is it takes two weeks for taste buds to grow back. And you start fla tasting flavors again. So I'm trying to get used to black coffee instead of stevia coffee. I'm getting used to the flavors of coffee. I'm getting used to the flavors of, you know, the, the 4,000 or 2,000 calorie cheesecake I had this weekend was a massive setback, but I'm yeah. back in the saddle. <laughs> but you're drinking black coffee. <laughs> you know, and the only, the, I think the most effective, this is what, we're sort of doing a little group therapy here, and that's what Susan Thompson will do for you. For $59, you can join her system, and she will put you through boot camp for 60 days and help you make habits. We're going to get to habits here in a bit. You will never have another piece of cheesecake or bakery again because all sugar is artificial or otherwise, and all flour, you will never have anything that is baked again. Correct. Basically. Correct. Mm -hmm. That's the price you have to pay. And you won't desire it. Or, no, wait, wait a minute. I used to have a BMI of 34, and I now have a BMI of 25. Wow. I am one half of 1%. I have accomplished this. It's taken me 10 years to do it. But I had cheesecake this weekend, but I'm not going to stay here. And I just got my Cleveland Heart Lab back today, and I can't keep doing that cheesecake and have uh, uh, my Cleveland Heart Lab. I have a father who died of diabetes, and I've got some pretty nasty genes. I probably shouldn't do that too often. You can probably pull it off once a year, here and there. Pick your poison. Pick your occasion. Make it really, really, really rare. You know. And then you really can't um, drink it all because of the sugar alcohol. Oh gosh, no. Mm -hmm. But the alcohol yeah. sugar is rather. Mm -hmm. Right. I drink water. Mm -hmm. I, I just drink water. Or I'm getting used to a bunch of herbal teas. I've got a lovely lemon tea I've found that actually I kind of find en entertaining. Uh, what about no alcohol? Yeah. Uh, alcohol? <laughs> <laughs> Which addiction story do we want to talk about? <laughs> the problem with alcohol is the problem with alcohol. <laughs> and it can, can you stop at one drink? Oh, I can stop at two. Yes. Wow. I can. Yeah, see, I'm clearly an addicted person. And that's probably just as well I didn't discover alcohol, because I'm sure I would be vulnerable to it if I allowed myself to. I've fortunately dodged it. So you don't drink any? No, no, no. I probably have, but I have probably four, four or five drinks a month. I'm just walking along a tight wire. It takes. Can you have them just all in one night and then? You've <laughs> <laughs> had a bad day. One night. I'm actually a lo I'm a, actually a wonderful date because one drink and I'm. I might, my jokes get much funnier, yeah, and, and <laughs> but then I have to go home by 8 o'clock because yeah. I, I fall asleep. That's yeah. exactly mm -hmm. right. But you're not used to it. So I'm just not used to it. Sure. So artificial sweeteners change our gut <coughs> biome. They induce a paradoxical starvation state leading to increased eating. There's good research that artificial, artificial sweeteners are actually worse than sugar. They're not a replacement for sugar. They're worse than sugar. So the boundary appears to be fresh fruit. Mm -hmm. And the research shows you can have a whole apple, but you can't have apple sauce. Because once you've taken that apple and chewed it up, you've taken the place of chewing, and you speed it up the time at which it gets into your gut, which means you speed it up the time your blood sugar rises. And so apple juice is the uber problem. Mm -hmm. So app there's no such thing as good fruit juice. And so orange juice, orange juice is poison. You know, yeah. apple juice is poison. Yeah, that's craziness. Juicing vegetables is nuts because all you're doing is taking out all the fiber and saving the sugar. Well, but if you leave the fiber in, the problem is I want you to chew. I want you to spend 10 minutes chewing, and you've let the blender do all the time of chewing. And if you have jaw problems? Dried fruit doesn't cut it, it's too intense. 
Applesauce is not okay. Apple juice is worse. Jams, jellies, smoothies, just as bad. Fresh, whole fruit. And the nuance to that is actually, again, I grew up in India. The world's original apple came from the Central Asian area, and it actually grew in the Himalaya Mountains where I went to school. It's about this big, and it's like a sour ball. When we went hiking, the villagers would have it, and have it cut in half, and you could get little black things that looked you know, like apples. And much smaller apples. Could an American farmer make a living selling those little sour, little sour balls? No. We want a honey crisp, honey. <laughs> so our modern fruit that used to be, that used to be a fruit, is now been or genetically engineered to being a, a giant tub of sugar. And we've done that with pears and fruit. Uh, the stone fruits are not quite as affected. The berries are less affected. The cantaloupes and melons are also less affected. So I'd say if you're going to eat fruit, I'm not sure bananas, pears, and apples should be on the list. I think you should focus more on the lower down the list. Uh, no flour. All flours. All flours. Flour is a way of taking a whole grain, removing the fiber on the outside, and turning it into talcum powder, which allows your digestive enzymes to have access to it. You can see the sequence. The glycemic index of whole oats is 19. Whole oats, what you feed a horse. When you crack an oak in half, an oat grain in half, we call it steel cut oats or Irish oats. Glycemic index is 38. But if you smash it and put it in a cardboard tube and make it call it quick oats, this cooks in 40 minutes, this cooks in 20 minutes. But if you smash it, and call it quick oats, the glycemic index is now 55. I'm not sure. I don't know. But super quick aluminum packet oats are 85. We say, oh, I'm going to have healthy food. I'm going to have oatmeal for breakfast. It's healthy if you're having this at the worst. Because you start putting out insulin around 40 and you're putting out a boatload of insulin by 55, and you're putting out a veritable fire hose by 85. So, don't, so that, this is what's called processing. That's what we're doing with grains. So the whole grain has got some carbs in it, but here's, okay, you get the drift, okay? Uh, and then wheat has wheat germ or glutenin in it. And wheat germ or glutenin is a small little lectin protein that really pumps glucose it really causes damage, and it sets off all sorts of other problems, which is wheat germ agglutinin mimics the metabolic effects of insulin. So when you're eating wheat, so people say I'm, I'm gluten sensitive, and I say no, you're actually wheat germ agglutinin sensitive. And that that's actually, but wheat is also, it's got a glycemic index, but it's also got wheat germ agglutinin in it, which I think is a compounding problem. Bummer. That's, I am almost 99% gluten-free until I got to that cheesecake. I haven't had bread for no. months. What about rice? Does that fit in that whole thing? Uh, I'm getting really good at making Indian food with no rice. <laughs> I just make giant spinach curries and vegetable curries, you know. Uh, no meals, no snacks, no decision making. We don't want any meals. So we want to move all decisions from the part of your brain that takes willpower to the automatic part of your brain that's pure habit. And that's why I'm going to make it automatic. And the automatic thing is every night I'm going to sit at my journal and I'm going to write down what I eat tomorrow. And then I make it ahead of time and I've made the decision and I don't have to get 10 o'clock in the morning saying I'm feeling a little hungry, what's in the refrigerator? Or what, where's the snack food machine? No, lunch is coming. I'm going to have lunch. We can do that. So you remove those choices. You're making new habits. And the research shows it takes 66 days to make a habit. Not 20, not 30. On average, 66 days. Some people will define automaticity in 18, as little as 18 days. Some people require 254 days. But the average is 66. So if you want to do, if you want willpower, that's what you need willpower for. That's what Susan her boot camp is 66 days. She wants you to make a habit. And that habit, she, one, of her, one of her points is, how confident are you that you will have brushed your teeth 
365 times from today. One year from today, how many times are you going to brush your teeth? 365, actually probably 730, right? Almost dead certain. You can't go to bed without brushing your teeth. Is it hard to make that decision? No. No. In fact, you sort of get out of bed in the morning and your mouth, uh, uh, I gotta brush my teeth. <laughs> right? Because it's just such a habit. We want that kind of automaticity with your food so that you get that confidence, so you're protected by that confidence, and so your brain doesn't get broken all over again. So, yeah. So, like you said about brushing your teeth, doesn't toothpaste have sugar in it? No. Oh, bother. I don't know, does it? Yeah, yeah, sure it does. It tastes good. It tastes good. Don't swallow it, though. You spit it out. Yeah, you spit it out. But it's still on the tongue, isn't it? Now I'm going to have to think about that tonight. <laughs> My grandmother used baking soda. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> so we just want to make new habits. We want to basically focus on making things automatic and the decision making is taken away and then your brain can repair itself. And by the way, don't exercise. There's no proof that exercise helps you lose weight. Just don't exercise. Don't worry about it. Don't do it. Forget it. <laughs> exercise doesn't help you. Your your computer is so accurate that when you exercise you eat more. So just don't do it. Don't worry about it. It's hard on your knees anyways. But there's other benefits. Yeah. Oh, there's other benefits to exercise, but don't do it to lose weight. Do it just because it's part of your lifestyle. I'm getting the habit of saying, okay, I'm meant to walk two miles every day. That part I can tolerate, but don't do it to lose weight. Do uh, you know you go two, you, every two weeks you got all new taste buds? No, I didn't. But your taste buds are so screwed up right now that until you, you get new ones every two weeks, there's new stem cells. But your food doesn't taste good for a week or two. Yeah, so the first two weeks, it's hard to do this. That's what I've had. The complaints I've had from my clients, I tell them this is coming. And when they come back to me and say, How, how'd you do? How'd your taste do? She says, yeah, first two weeks is blech. And then suddenly it wakes up. Your taste buds wake up. It's like you haven't been. No, I think that a lot of American food is horribly made, but that's a separate issue. So here's her plan. This is her plan. Every day for breakfast, you're going to have one protein, one grain, one fruit. For lunch, a protein, six ounces of vegetables, a fruit, and a fa well, fat. For supper, a protein, six ounces of vegetables, a salad, and fat. What's her, what is her grain? Yeah, I thought we couldn't have grain. And in her book, she's got all these laid out. So here's are the breakfast grains. This is what you can call a grain. Okay. This is what you can call uh, a protein. Okay. This is what you can call a plant-based protein if you want to do plant-based. So those are all, the, we don't know, you, you can't mem remember them anyways, but they're all in her book. And she gives you a fairly simple formula. So if you want, you want to look in the table, you can have eight ounces of unsweetened soy milk, or you can have four ounces of tofu, or four ounces of hummus, or two ounces of nuts, or two ounces of seeds. That all counts as your morning breakfast grain. But you're going to weigh it, two ounces. So uh, anybody here got a scales from... Uh, the, like the precise scales that weigh, yeah. right. They're now widely available on Amazon at Target. Target has them. Where'd you get yours? Amazon, 50 bucks. Target's got them too. Right. And the, on every one of them, they all have a zero quality. So when you put a bowl on and push zero, it now weighs zero. So it weighs precisely what you're putting in it as opposed to what you, you know, added to it. Okay. Fruit. Here's the fruits and what they count, the, the fruit range. Here's their vegetables. Okay, and their fats, the fats are butter, margarine, you know, you, you can have a choice of fats, one tablespoon or half ounce, one tablespoon, weigh it. Because you know what your lizard brain's going to do? <laughs> that looks like a tablespoon. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Four tablespoons, okay, uh, half a stick of butter, okay. Yeah. It sounds like a tablespoon. Conclusion, you can do this. Admit your sugar donkey, stand up, join me. <laughs> I am a sugar junkie. <laughs> then learn new habits. Get yourself on new habits. I've seen people do this. I'm just so proud of the folks I've seen do. I, that, to today, going, I was doing this talk tonight, that woman who came in and figured it out on her own was just awesome. I'm just so proud of her. And what's interesting to me is she attributed it all to her hormones being balanced. She said, I finally got my hormones balanced so I felt better. And I said, you know, I'll take a little bit of credit, but I think you really get 80%. She really gets 80% she had, because it's the discipline and the habit. So I was really curious. How did you get into that habit? I said, is it hard for you to do it? She said, nope. 
I just, it's just, I, that's, I have to do that every night. I don't do it at 9 o'clock. I do it about 7.30. So how do you eat out? <laughs> how do you travel? How do you go on vacation? How do you eat out? Yeah, yeah those are all like issues. The, the concern, uh, Susan Thompson says, take your scales with you. So Holly and I were just in Florida for a week on Fort Myers Beach. I took my scales down there. And I behaved very well that week, actually. It was only when I got home to the chocolate cake I got put <laughs> in. <laughs> I, I did quite well. Really? And I've got a bunch of different recipes. Here's one recipe. This is the recipe we're having fun with all week. Holly loves me doing this because I'm now cooking 10 times more than I've ever cooked before. But here's a fun recipe. One of my clients brought this in. One of the ones who's doing this. This is her recipe. You take a big soup pot, and she put in, she had the formula for me. I, have, I don't have it here. She said, I took a half a cup of olive oil, put it in a pan, and four garlic cloves and a half an onion. Chop it up. And those are frying. Onion, garlic, and olive oil. And then she got a half a jar of Thai green curry paste. And put that in, fry, 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 fry. And about a half a pound of green beans, and a half a pound of broccoli, and a half a pound of uh, yellow squash. I've now tried it with carrots. I've tried it with all sorts of different vegetables. It's, they're all good. It's the green curry. And then one can of coconut milk and one can of vegetable soup stock. And that Thai green curry just makes a slightly exotic flavor and the vegetables are suddenly delicious. So we made one with a putting in, we made one based about half spinach and half green beans that was one. We made the one we're having right now is carrots and, you know, just m almost any vegetables. So uh, 50 different varieties of vegetables. The core idea is a can of coconut oil, a can of vegetable broth, and half a bottle of Thai green curry, you mean which coconut milk. Coconut milk. Oh, I'm sorry, coconut milk. Okay. But pick and save all has Thai green curry. Susan Thompson says as long as it's ingre more than ingredient number four, yeah. oh, okay. or three. Do you have what? Oh yeah, I, th 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 we can get into the details. I, th I would say margarine's poison. Don't don't do margarine. Right. Uh, you know, if you're gonna make oil, co use coconut oil or o olive oil. Right now, I'd say the overwhelming most important thing, the 99% gorilla, is to lose weight. Worry about the margarine. That's a, okay, down the road once you've lost. Once you've gone through four months of boot camp, everybody loses weight. Everybody loses weight doing this. Everybody loses weight doing this. It works. This method is 55 times more reliable at losing weight than anything invented yet. This is 55 times because... Your lizard brain is 55 times smarter than you are. Because when you try to do it on your own with willpower and Weight Watchers and everything else that all of you in this room have tried all your lives, <laughs> it doesn't work. All the things we've done haven't worked. And so it's like, we've got to come up with a different technology. And this, I think this is it. So I don't claim anybody needs to come see me to do this. You need to go right on Susan Thompson's website and check it out with her. I think she's a genius, and I think we give her credit for being a just unbelievably insightful woman. So I know you really like the keto diet. How, did the, how does this compare? Well, the keto diet was, let me put that in context. The keto diet, the paleo diet, was quite a rush for a couple of years, and then some inconvenient truths came along. And those inconvenient truths were the more animal protein you eat, the more heart disease you get. And the Harvard, Mental, the Harvard Men's Health Study reexamined their data and found that men in the top quartile of protein have 50% more heart disease. That's a bummer. Uh, and then there was research showing that TMAO from red meat makes more coronary artery disease. But then the most interesting research of all came out on gorillas. For those of you who know my practice, you might have heard this before. So here's your trivia quiz. You're now on medical jeopardy. Gorillas eat 15 pounds of green leaves a day. What percent of their diet is keto, is fat? And the options are 1%, 2%, 5%, 70%. Of fat? 
And you've taken multiple choice exams and you know when there's three clustered, it's always the outlier. So how's it 70%? The answer as a gorilla's diet is 70% ketogenic. How? It turns out that when a gorilla eats spinach, it's not digested in their stomach. It's not digested in their small bowel. It's di the cell walls of spinach are digested by the bacteria in their colon. And they make beta-hydroxybutyrate. And 70% of the calories that a gorilla gets, which means the real keto diet is a green vegetable diet, otherwise known as broccoli, asparagus, spinach, cabbage, cauliflower, green above ground vegetables. And that meat should be really thought of as a condiment, a relatively rare condiment. And I have proven that because I've been doing the fast mimicking diet myself. Every month I spend five days at 800 calories. And when I measure my ketones, I never lose my ketones eating spinach. I can eat all the spinach I want, I don't lose ketones. My ketones, my beta hydroxybutyrate on finger testing is still present. If I eat one 70 calorie sweet potato, ketones are gone for two days. Yeah. So the, the sweet potato, we thought, I thought sweet potatoes are pretty good. They're, you know, they're not white potatoes, they're sweet potatoes. But there's enough carbs in the sweet potatoes to lose ketones. So, so a keto diet, in my humble opinion, is a green vegetable, leaf-based diet. So the soup I just gave you is basically a very keto diet because it's coconut oil and green vegetables. Coconut milk. Co um, coconut milk. What are your thoughts on the lectin? You hear a lot about the lectin, vegetables, and fruits. Uh, I think that's very real. Uh, if you have autoimmune diseases, it's particularly real. Uh, it's just... It, the problem is it narrows you down to narrow. What was her question? Uh, her question is, what do you think about the lectins? Uh, wheat is a, a very potent lectin. And so there's, you know, I think you're getting rid of a potent lectin by this. But the other lectins that, this is Stephen Gundry's work about, uh, about lectin-free diet. And, and I've had people succeed with that, but not everybody. But, uh, you know, so... Can you stay away from all the lectin-containing foods? Tom I'm trying to stay away from tomatoes, but I can't get rid of chilies. <laughs> 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 you know, I really love, you know, green peppers. I can give up green peppers, you know. But, but so, and I have had, un in my practice, I've had, I could regale you with wonderful stories of people who've been unbelievably helped by getting on a pure lectin-free diet. I'm absolutely convinced that Gundry's onto something. We don't know how to test it yet. And that will get there eventually. And my, when I came back from this last week, uh, I've now taken a course on peptides. And I told Dan I want to come do a, probably do a lecture on peptides here. And pay attention, that's coming. So any more questions? It's already getting late.